Hi, welcome back to another episode of Chosen, the Entrepreneur series. In this playlist, I tell the stories of those entrepreneurs that have had a profound impact on this world that we live in, but have not gotten the coverage they well deserve. Because these are the stories that I found incredibly motivating and inspirational. By shedding light on some of their struggles and triumphs, I hope you can walk away knowing a little more, be a little more inspired, a little more hopeful, or simply with just a little more to think about. As always, agree or disagree with me, your thoughts are valued in this channel, so please leave a message in the comment section below. Now, without further ado, please sit back, relax, and enjoy this story, the story of Jiang Yiming. His story begins in the year 1983, in the Fujian province of China. Neither rich nor poor, he was a millennial born into a middle-class family at a time when China had just announced its open-door policy. It was during this time between the 80s and 90s, China moved towards a socialist market economy and began to transition much of its state-owned enterprises into private companies. Zhang's father was among a class of government workers that was reassigned to manage one of such enterprises, an electronics processing factory in the city of Dongguan, and because of this enabled the young Zhang Yiming to have an early exposure to cutting-edge technology and equipment. Zhang's parents were not typical Chinese parents. Unlike the authoritarian style of parenting popular in most Chinese families, Zhang's parents adopted a permissive parenting approach. They allowed him to pursue his passions and envision his own future. His parents were forward-thinking, they embraced innovation and welcomed new ideas. From an early age, Zhang would find himself fascinated by his family's conversations over the dining table. Topics would range from discussing their friends' overseas tech venture to the latest products being made at his father's company. Zhang grew up in such an environment that encouraged him to try new things and coupled with having an early exposure to his father's business, he quickly developed a mind for innovation and entrepreneurship. Zhang entered high school excelling in math and sciences. In fact, chemistry was his favorite subject up until an accident he caused during a lab experiment at school. From then on, he reckoned his second favorite subject, computer science, was a much safer choice, which he later declared as a major when he entered Nankai University in 2001. Zhang was by no means a highly sociable person. In fact, most around him would describe him as quiet and reserved. He was a geek through and through. But upon admitting to university, it wouldn't take long before he became among his campus's most popular students. His stellar academic performance not only took the notice of his professors, but his classmates as well. Revered for his computer wizardry, students across campus would often come asking for his help when they encountered computer-related issues. And one time, on a winter afternoon, as Jan was working on a problem set in his dorm room, he received an online message on BBS. The message was from a girl in his school, and in it she wrote that her computer broke down the night before. She implored him to help. Zhang agreed and would fix her computer later that day. And when it was all said and done, she was in awe of him, and he was mesmerized by her. Little did he know as he left her dorm room that night, this girl would become the love of his life, and to this day, his happily married wife. Rumor has it, due to Jiang's busy work life after graduating from university, the couple never even hosted a wedding ceremony, nor have they taken wedding photos or have gone on a honeymoon vacation. But they never cared for traditions and extravagances. Their idea of a romantic date include playing chess on an iPad, having debates on business management theories, as well as discussing user experience on new apps. They were made for each other. In 2005, after graduating from university, Zhang and his wife packed their bags and moved to Beijing, the country's capital city, a city filled with promises and opportunities. 
Jen received a call one night from an older university alumni, asking Jiang to partner with him on his new startup idea. The idea was to provide identity and assets management systems for corporations and enterprises, a service he believed was lacking in the marketplace at the time. Jiang was highly interested in this idea and decided to form the startup. However, due to poor market positioning, the startup failed within a year. But this experience did not phase Jiang. In February of 2006, he joined a new startup by the name of Ku Sun as the company's first software engineer. Ku Sun was one of China's first travel apps used for booking flights, hotels, trains, and more. It experienced massive success later on and was acquired by TripAdvisor in 2009 and then sold to the Meituan Group in 2015. About half a year after Jiang joined Ku Sun, Jiang needed to book a train ticket to travel home back to Fujian for the Chinese Spring Festival holidays, the biggest human migration on the planet. So it comes as no surprise that train tickets were very hard to come by during those times. And the only way to find out whether tickets were available was to constantly refreshing the app. Annoyed by this tediousness, Jiang spent his lunch hour that day writing a piece of code that would allow himself to be notified via SMS text message when a ticket would become available for purchase. And within 10 minutes upon completing his code, he was already notified that a ticket was available. He was surprised at how useful this feature was, and this notion of having relevant information sent him directly, instead of having to search for himself, stuck with him for years to come. An epiphany, if you will, for creating his apps widely used today, such as Toutiao and TikTok. In just a year of working at Kusun, Jiang was already promoted to a managerial position and was in charge of overseeing more than 40 employees. But Jiang felt that because he's been an engineer all along, he lacked the skills to be an effective manager. He wanted to learn and gain exposure to what management was like at a larger corporation. So in 2008, he left Kusun and joined Microsoft. But it didn't take him long to realize that he wasn't going to make enough of an impact at such a large company. So he quit Microsoft in a year and started his first solo company. And this company was called 99Fang, a real estate search portal. It was a startup that rode the beginning of the mobile internet wave. In just six months of founding the startup, Jiang launched six applications and attracted 1.5 million users on his platform, making it the number one real estate platform in the Chinese market at the time. But two years later in 2012, Jiang wanted to take advantage of a rapidly growing mobile internet market in China to revisit the idea he had a few years ago, the idea of distributing personalized information. So at age 29, now equipped with plenty of startup and management experience, he resigned as CEO of 99Fang and founded a company that would disrupt multiple industries. This company would be named ByteDance. This was where it all started, in a $3,000 a month rented apartment situated on the Third Ring Road of Beijing. During a recent visit back to the old apartment, Jen remembers that there was a general working area, two meeting rooms, a room for UI development, a room for finance, and another room for R&D. Not to mention there was a kitchen that would serve two meals a day and his employees would whiff the delicious smell of home cooked food as it was being prepared and used it as motivational work. Looking back, Jiang would say, for a startup, our working conditions were not so bad. Our office space was small, but our dream was big. It was in this office where we thought about our grand vision. We thought about the things we would create, the way we would do it, and even gone so far as the dream, one day going global. And as ByteDance set course to conquer its hopes and dreams, it required larger sums of funding, and securing Series A was no easy task. Jan recalled losing his voice after pitching to over 30 venture capital firms in a month. While most VCs restrained from investing in ByteDance during his first round of funding, mostly due to uncertainty in his business model, one VC had invested their money and confidence in Jang from the very beginning. 
and that VC was a firm none other than SIG Siskihanna, who invested approximately 5 million US dollars in Series A. SoftBank Group, Sequoia Capital, General Atlantic, and Tiger Global Management were among others that joined in later rounds of funding. And then, like a rock star, ByteDance launched one hit app after the next. Nihan Duanzi, ByteDance's first app launched in March of 2012, was an app for memes and jokes. The name Nihan translates to connotation or innuendo, and Duanzi means jokes in English. The app can be thought of being somewhat similar to 9gag and FML. Nihan Duanzi was widely popular and had a cult like following, 200 million of them by some reports. It was hip, it was trendy, and it was the place for young people to be. Members would put bumper stickers of the app on their cars, and they even had a secret honk that they would honk at one another on the streets that sounded something like this. The user base was so loyal that when the app was shut down by the government, it was reported that over 700 users took to the streets to protest. More about this incident later in this video. Toutiao, which translates to headline in English, was launched on August of 2012. It's one of the company's flagship apps. In the words of ByteDance, it is a news aggregator platform that offers a unique, personalized, and comprehensive content consumption experience. In simpler terms, Total delivers news and information that is most relevant to each individual user. Or in even simpler terms, Total is an AI curated news app. As of June of 2019, the app has over 260 million monthly active users, or MAU for short. Sigua Video, also known as Watermelon Video, is a video hosting platform similar to YouTube but began with only short form videos that average 2 to 5 minutes long. The platform has since expanded to hosting long-form videos, 4K streaming, and has moved to incorporate professional content, including Chinese blockbuster movies such as Lost in Russia, and even signed content deals with BBC Studios for documentaries and children's programming. In March of 2020, Sigua Video had an estimated MAU of 270 million. TikTok probably requires no introduction. Chances are, in one way or another, you've come across a TikTok video in your daily life. It's those dancing, singing, short skip videos that you constantly see. TikTok is the world's leading destination for super short form mobile videos, spanning on average just 3 to 15 seconds long. The app is available in 155 countries and 75 languages. As of October of 2020, TikTok was reported to have 800 million MAU globally. For perspective, that's more than the MAU of Snapchat and Twitter combined. It falls just below Instagram at a billion monthly active users. According to Forbes, many content creators are now able to make a living off of TikTok alone. Addison Ray Easterling, Charlie D'Amelio, Dixie D'Amelio, Lauren Gray, and Josh Richards are among long lists of creators that have made millions of dollars on the app. Other apps that are under ByteDance include Hello in India, Lark in Japan and Singapore, Baby in Indonesia, and many more. At the core of these apps is the AI algorithm that generates and delivers personalized information and content. The very idea Jang had first envisioned that one afternoon years ago working at Kusun when he needed to buy a train ticket. The country's three largest tech conglomerates Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent collectively known as BAT, has been market leaders in the tech industry for years now. A common consensus in the tech community is that it is impossible for Chinese tech startups to experience success without the backing of one of the BATs. The saying goes, chances are if you're not funded by them, you'd be crushed by them. ByteDance, however, was the first and only tech startup to break the mold, and is also the most well equipped to surpass the BATs in the future. Now, collectively as a group, it's worth over $100 billion, making it the most valuable private startup in the world, almost twice the valuation of the second most valuable private startup, Didi Chuxing. SpaceX, Stripe, and Airbnb are the third, fourth, and fifth highest value startups according to Statista. ByteDance also reportedly generated over $20 billion in revenue the past year, and now it has 60,000 employees and 36 offices across the world. Neil Shin from Sequoia Capital, regarded as one of Asia's most successful venture capitalists today, have even said repeatedly that his decision to not invest in ByteDance back in Series A was one of the biggest regrets of his career. Fortunately for him, on behalf of Sequoia Capital, he has since invested $100 million in ByteDance during Series C, and has become a member of the board, developing a close professional relationship with Jang. 
both companies have benefited tremendously from this investment. ByteDance's meteoric rise to success led many to believe the journey was smooth sailing, but this could not be any further from the truth. In its eight years of existence, Jangna's company has battled multiple lawsuits against its competitors, has also had its fair share of scrutiny by governments across the world. Since 2013, Toutiao has been involved in copyright disputes, sued by news outlets such as the Beijing News, Changsha Evening, Guangzhou Daily, and Chutian Metropolis Daily. But perhaps the most prominent case is with Sohu, one of China's most popular news publishers. Sohu claimed that Toutiao infringed its copyrights by reformatting its original content onto Toutiao's own app. According to Sohu, this reformatting technology, instead of directing users to the original page, would divert traffic and ad revenues from Sohu's website. After the case was settled, Jang made sure that news publishers were given a choice to opt out of having their content displayed within the Toutiao app, and if they chose to do so, readers would be provided a link within the app diverting them to the original publisher's website. In 2018, ByteDance's first app, Nehan Duanzi, was banned overnight by the government after vulgar and improper content was found in its live streams that were posted by users within the app. In the blink of an eye, Jang and his team's years of hard work vanished. The state administration of radio and television, the government regulators of media content, even issued a public statement cautioning ByteDance to better self-regulate its content across all of its platforms. The app has such a cult-like user base that the ban sparked protests across major cities, most prominent being in Beijing, where it was reported that over 700 users, consisting of mostly younger millennials, parked their cars right outside of the government offices. They chanted, they sung, and they even honked their secret honk. An important point to note here is that in the United States, social media companies are protected by Section 230, a law that grants them immunity to the content its users share on its platform, similar to how a bookstore is not responsible for the content within the books that they sell. If a user posts defamatory content on Facebook for example, the person defamed would only be allowed to sue the user that created the post, and not Facebook itself. In China, however, the law states that regardless whether the company categorizes itself as a publisher or a content maker, the company would still be responsible for the content distributed on its platform. The Chinese president Xi Jinping has stated explicitly in April of 2016, those in e-commerce platforms has to be vigilant of fakes, those who operate social media platforms cannot engage in spreading rumors, and those who make search engines cannot just give away clicks to the highest bidders. A message at the time clearly directed to the BATs, but applies to the rest of the tech industry as well, including ByteDance. So without a doubt, after the Nehan Duanzi incident, Zhang did not have the best reputation in the eyes of the Chinese government. Zhang, however, has since issued a formal apology for the poor supervision of its platform's content. He has since vowed to hold this company to an even higher standard than what the law requires in regards to content regulation. In 2019, TikTok was fined $5.7 million by the US government for breaching child privacy regulations as it failed to obtain parental consent before collecting names, email addresses, and other information from children younger than the age of 13. And just recently, in August of 2020, pointing to national security concerns, US President Donald Trump signed an executive order that effectively bans the use of TikTok in the US, unless it was sold to an American company. While the legal battle between the US government and TikTok is not over, ByteDance has already been in negotiations with Oracle and Walmart for a deal. The news of a potential sale has angered the Chinese government, keeping in mind that Zhang has angered the Chinese government before, and his reputation is still being recovered from the Nehan Duanzi's incident. Even before negotiations took place among TikTok, Oracle, and Walmart, China has already hinted that they were against such a sale. Shortly after Trump's executive order, the Chinese Ministry of Commerce added a new item in its export control list, and the item description is personalized content recommendations based on data analysis, a description most people would agree TikTok falls under. So all of this puts Zhang in a very awkward position. On one hand, Zhang wants to capitalize on ByteDance's investment in years of building up TikTok in the United States, estimated worth in the double-digit billions today. 
But on the other hand, Jang does not want his domestic reputation to tarnish. So what would you do if you were Jang? I'm curious as to what you guys think. Let me know down below. These examples are just a few of many obstacles that ByteDance have encountered over the years. But under Jang's leadership, the company has managed to learn to react quickly and emerge largely unscathed. Today, Forbes estimates Jiang to worth over $16 billion, the ninth richest person in China and the 61st in the world. Along with owning a $100 billion global business, he is widely regarded as a successful entrepreneur. Jiang attributes his and his company's success to a number of factors, including having a laser clear vision, ability to continue to learn and innovate, and a hiring practice for people that are grounded but courageous. He explained in an interview that the road to success is rarely linear, but having a clear vision is a constant reminder of the direction he should be headed towards and allows him to worry less on temporary setbacks. The objective is never to not make mistakes, instead it is to deviate less from a straight path. Jeff Bezos, the founder and CEO of Amazon as well as the world's richest individual, was quoted as saying something similar. Take a listen. You really can't accomplish anything important if you're not stubborn on vision because things that are important take a long time, they take teams, you can't do it by yourself. And so you really need to, you have, need to have a crisp idea of the vision, you need to stay incredibly relentless on that vision. But you need to be flexible on the details because you've got to be experimental to accomplish anything important. And that means you're going to be wrong a lot and so you're going to try something on your way to that vision and that's going to be the wrong Thing, the wrong decision, you're going to have to back up, take a little course correction and try again. And so you cannot be stubborn on the details, you have to be flexible on the details. Jeff Bezos was an entrepreneur that Jiang says he studied as he was starting his company. He's read his books and watched his interviews and it clearly shows in similarities of their management styles and approaches. Jiang's quest to become a great leader has never stopped though. Even to this day, he continues to read books about other great leaders. He looks to apply certain aspects of their management and philosophy to his own role. Leaders that he says he has studied include Jeff Bezos as I mentioned earlier, and Jack Welch, Steve Jobs, and even Mark Zuckerberg. Like most tech entrepreneurs would tell you, it is extremely important to continue to innovate, and Jiang believes the same. When asked about how Chinese tech companies fare with foreign companies, he replied bluntly, said that American companies like Google and Apple still does a better job in software, for example with their operating systems like Android and iOS, which so far no Chinese operating system has been able to replace. But he believes what ByteDance has in competitive advantage is its AI technology, and it's vital that the company continues to innovate and improve in this area. Jiang has come a long way since his early days as a programmer. Over a decade of experience in starting and running companies, has taught him a few things of what it takes to be a great leader. For one, he preaches delayed gratification. He says it helps him keep a long-term mindset as well as staying humble and grounded, which is good for making sound decisions for the company. And to ensure that other managers stay grounded also, Chan forbids title calling in the office and maintains a flat structure within the organization, so employees can communicate to one another freely without the barriers of having multiple levels. ByteDance is said to only have 3 to 4 levels in its hierarchy, contrast with a company like Alibaba that has over 14. A flat organizational structure is rare in Chinese companies because status is something highly sought after in Chinese culture. But not to Jiang Yiming. Ever since he was a kid, he's known not to be trapped by dogmatic thinking. Being open-minded and escaping the status quo was what he's been doing since an early age. Being courageous though is important because as a startup, a company is defined by the bull bets it makes, which is why Jang is in constant search for talent that can assume ownership, take risks, and break the mold. It's clear that Jang tries to use his tech for good and to the benefit of the community. A great example of this is Toteo's missing person search feature, a non-profit feature within the app that allows users to report missing persons cases. After a case is reported, the app's algorithm will automatically send the relevant case details to those users in the vicinity of the missing person's last seen location. 
In other words, as a user, you would only receive a notification if you were close by. As of June of 2020, this feature has helped find over 13,000 missing persons. But despite all that Jang and his company does, the future for the company is still somewhat uncertain with the increasing amount of political pressure received both domestically and abroad. Yet there's a quote by Elon Musk that I found to be particularly applicable to Jang's current situation. Basically, if, if, if you get it such that your customers want you to succeed, mm. then, then you probably will. All right. You have to focus on the customer delivering for them. Yeah, make yeah. sure if your customers love you, you will, your odds of success are dramatically higher. Yeah. We've seen a level of enthusiasm from ByteDance's members that goes unmatched by any other app users. First, we've seen in Nehan Duanzi's protests, where users flooded the streets to demand to have their app unbanned. And now, we see in the case of Trump's order to shut down TikTok, where some of the app's influencers have took it upon themselves to fight the ban. In fact, they were successful in securing an injunction from a judge in Pennsylvania, and now TikTok remains online and usable past Trump's deadline of November 12th. So, with a user base that genuinely loves and roots for your company, perhaps Jan might just be able to take by dance to greater heights. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed this backstory of the man behind TikTok, or ByteDance rather, Zhang Yiming. If you did, I'd be grateful if you would smash the like button and click subscribe to help grow this channel, a channel where I tell the stories of the lesser known entrepreneurs. So that concludes this video and until we meet again in the next one, please stay safe and healthy during these difficult and troubling times. My name is Martin and this has been Chosen, the Entrepreneur Series.